Well, good morning, church family. It is so good to see everybody here this morning. It is so good to be in God's house this morning. Before we begin with our time of worship, I'm going to level with you on a couple of things, okay? This morning has not gotten off to the best start, and let me tell you why that is. If you live around here or you were in the building at about 845 this morning, then everything you own that was electric suddenly shut off and then came back on. Anybody experience that at home or you were here in the building? Yeah, all the lights turned off, everything turned off, turned right back on. Some kind of power surge here in the neighborhood. Um, that applied to this room as well. And one of the things that that ended up meaning is that these projectors here above me that normally display the words for you when we sing together, those projectors are now locked. And the best way we have figured out how to fix that is to climb up on a very tall ladder and deal with it that way. That did not happen this morning. Um, and so what that means is I am counting on you to use these things, these hymnals that sit as a beautiful decoration most Sundays in the rack in front of you. And we are going to be relying on those hymnals this morning. Um, we've made one or two adjustments to the order of service, and so I will let you know about those as they come. But I tell you all of that to tell you, number one, that you're going to need your hymnal this morning. And so make sure that you are employing that so that you have the words. And number two, because I am relying upon you, as I do every Sunday, but especially today, I am relying on you to worship today. Because if I'm being fully transparent with you, right now my head is in a million places. And so if I'm going to lead worship well, I'm going to need you to participate in worship well, okay? So let's all stand together. Let's sing together. Let's worship, beginning with hymn number 308, Glorious is Thy Name. Father God, we thank you for this morning. 
we thank you, Lord, that we can come together in this place with brothers and sisters in Christ, that we can lift up songs of praise to you, that, that we can worship you in spirit and in truth. And so, Father, I pray that this morning, whatever things are rumbling around in our minds and in our hearts and in our thoughts, whatever distractions um, are plaguing us right now, Lord, that we would set those to the side or better yet, lay those at the foot of the cross this morning. Father, that every word that is sung this morning would be one that we mean deep within our hearts, that every word that is spoken, that is prayed, every deed that is done is to your glory and to your name. And it's in that name, the beautiful name of Jesus, that I pray all of these things. Amen. You may be seated. Well, projectors and screens notwithstanding, it is an exciting day here at South Garland Baptist Church. First and foremost, because we get to worship together, we will take the Lord's Supper at the end of our worship service here this morning. And the fun doesn't stop there. Tonight, we are having uh, an annual tradition of sorts here at South Garland Baptist Church. We asked last Sunday how long we have been doing our annual chili cook-off. And as best we can determine, this church is more than 50 years old and the chili cook-off is more than 60 years old. Um, <laughs> I'm making that up, but only a little bit. Um, and so we are doing that tonight. This is a fundraiser for youth camp. And so I invite you to come out. If you have made a pot of chili, then you can enter that in. And it's a contest as well. And speaking of it being a contest, there are different categories. There is spiciest chili. There is most unique chili. There is best overall chili. And then there is the people's choice that you vote on rather than the judges. And third place gets a certificate, second place gets a certificate, first place gets a golden ladle. I have been asked if that is real gold on the ladle. And my answer is, will that change how much you contribute to the youth group? Um, I hope that y'all will join us tonight. Whether you're bringing chili or just coming to eat chili, we would love to see you. A suggested donation of $5 a bowl. Um, we would love for you to come out, support our students, and have a great time of fellowship tonight. For right now, speaking of fellowship, we want to make sure we get the chance to greet one another, to tell each other how glad we are that you are here today. So let's stand to our feet and let's greet and welcome one another. begin to make your way back to your seats. I want to invite all the children that we have here in the sanctuary this morning. Kids, come on down to the front and Miss Sarah's got a message just for y'all. Oh, well, good morning. Okay, we're going to start off here. I'm going to let y'all borrow some money. Open your hands. Okay, let me ask you all a question. Would you go to the doctor if you were really healthy and just fine? Would you want to go to the doctor? Would you need to go to the doctor? I'm sorry, baby. But what about, would you go to the doctor if you were really sick? Yeah. And wouldn't you want, if mommy or daddy was sick, you would want them to be able to go to the doctor, right? Would you want somebody to go to the doctor in their place that wasn't sick? What if somebody who wasn't sick got their appointment and then they couldn't go? No. Okay. Y'all have some money here. You didn't get any. I'm sorry. You want some money, Kirk? Oh, okay. So, you know what? Jesus, one of his stories, okay? Jesus told people that, hey, the sick need to go to the doctor to get well. Just like sinners need a, save for, a savior to be saved, right? 
Who was our savior? It was Jesus, okay? And remember this, they need a savior, a savior, and he's the only one who's perfect. And none of us are perfect. None of us out here are perfect either, okay? Do y'all remember any of the disciples' names? Any of y'all remember any of them? John, me? Me wasn't one of them. Andrew was one of them. Yeah. So guess what? Some of, most of the disciples, a lot of them were fishermen. Did y'all know that? They would go fishing. But we're going to talk about somebody named Matthew that was not a fisherman. He was a tax collector. Do y'all remember hearing about tax collectors? Did people like tax collectors? No? Okay, here's, let me give y'all a little example. Everybody had to pay tax. So you have your coins right here. And this is why people didn't like tax collectors. So here, say if I said, okay, give me your coins. And that's all the money you have, right? Give me your coins. But what if I told you, oh, you only gave me that. I need you to give me six more. You don't have six more? How would that make you feel if you thought you gave me all that you were supposed to give and then I told you you had to give me more? Would that make you upset? That would make you not like the person that was the tax collector. I'm not the tax collector, so you, don't, you can't not like me, okay? So the tax collectors took more money than they should. And you know what they did with it? They put that extra money right here in their pocket. So people didn't like them. So Matthew, he was a thief because that's like stealing, right? So he was a thief, and he wasn't a really good guy, but Jesus got him to turn his life around. So here's what happened. He went to go hang out with Matthew, and Matthew was a sinner, which were all sinners, okay? But Matthew was a tax collector nobody liked. So when Jesus went to go eat with him and hang out with him, all of his friends were mad, and they couldn't understand why he would waste his time going to hang out with a sinner because they thought ah, we do everything right he should only hang out with us but is that true does jesus only love the ones that do everything right yeah. no but guess what not uh, nobody does everything right because jesus was the only one who was perfect so when we mess up he gives us grace and he forgives us just like he forgave matthew and guess what Matthew stopped being bad, and Matthew followed him. But if Jesus never took the time to maybe go and sit with him and talk to him and give him his love, he may not have ever decided to stop being bad. So it's our job to show others that love and grace. So if somebody hurts your feelings or what if anybody ever called you a name, maybe taken something of yours or something that you wanted, even a toy, something like that, we're supposed to forgive them. That's what showing grace is. You can't stay mad forever. And you know what happens if you do stay mad forever? Who remembers we say? That little bit of anger in your heart takes over your whole heart. And then is there room for any of the good stuff in your heart anymore? No, no, y'all, there's not. Okay, so remember this. Jesus said that the sick need a doctor and not the well, just like sinner, sinners need a savior and not the perfect. None of us are perfect, so we all need a Savior. Okay, can we remember that? Can we be like Jesus? Can y'all show me how to pray? How do y'all pray? Do we only pray at church? Do we only pray at dinner? No. Does anybody pray at nighttime? You pray three times. You can pray three more times than that. You can pray whenever, because guess what? That's you getting to talk to God, just the two of you. So it doesn't have to be anyone telling you. It's whenever you need to talk to God and whenever you need help to be strong or to be kind. Sometimes we need to ask God to help us to be nice. Some of us really sometimes need to ask God to help us to be nice. Any of y'all? Okay, let's show me how to pray, y'all. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes. Dear Lord, thank you so much for your grace. Thank you for loving us and forgiving us even when we do wrong. Help us to remember to forgive others and to be like you, Lord, and to show grace, and to love everyone that's different from us. Help us not to think that we're perfect, or to think that we can only love people who are perfect. Help us to remember that everyone is our neighbor. Help us to be like Jesus, Lord, and kind like Jesus, and all of the words that we say, and all of the way that we treat others, Lord. 
let your light shine through all of these kids. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, if you look in your bulletin, then what you will see is that the next song we were supposed to sing this morning is a beautiful newer song that introduced to you just a few weeks ago called His Name is Jesus. Love that song, both the message and the music. However, I am pretty confident you don't know the words to it yet. Um, you just heard it for the first time a few weeks ago. And so rather than make this a solo performance, we're going to flip on over to hymn number 310. Hymn number 310, and we're going to sing together, Blessed Be the Name. You can remain seated as we sing this hymn together. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, blessed be the name of the Lord, the glories of my God and King. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And the third verse. He breaks the power of canceled sin. Blessed be the name of the Lord. His blood can make the foulest clean. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. I never shall forget that day, blessed be the name of the Lord. When Jesus washed my sins away, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I'm reading from Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 12. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Amen. Thank you, Kelly. Our next hymn speaks to exactly what we've heard there, the idea that Jesus is a friend to each and every one of us, to the sinner as well as to the saints. So let's sing together hymn number 154, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Let's stand together as we sing. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. and temptations is there trouble anywhere we should never be discouraged take it to the Lord in prayer can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrow share knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. 
Despise, forsake thee. Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou wilt find a solace there. Turn with me to hymn number 105, Grace Greater Than Our Sin. grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God Dark is the stain that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide. Whiter than snow you may be today. Grace, grace. God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within, grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin, marvelous infinite matchless grace freely bestowed on all who believe you who are longing to see his face will you this moment his grace receive grace 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 God's grace that will pardon and cleanse within grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Thank you. You may be seated. Let's pray together. God of grace and God of glory, thank you that you allow us to be in your presence this morning. Thank you, Father, that we are allowed to sing your praises because you're worthy of them. Thank you, Lord, for the grace that you have given us that is beyond our understanding. Father, we thank you for this church. We thank you for its ministries. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity we have to be a part of that through our participation through our service, and through our tithes and offerings. Now, Lord, we ask your blessings upon this offering that we're to take. We pray, God, that you would bless the money that is given, that you would use it for the advancement of your kingdom. And, Lord, you, that you would bless each of the givers, that you would bless them individually and their families. Lord, that each of us would be the people you would have us to be. Lord, just make us to be more like Jesus. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amazing grace 
How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. It was grace that taught my heart to fear. And grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, his mercy reigns, unending love and amazing grace. The Lord has promised good to me. His word my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns unending joy amazing grace my shoes are gone they've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending joy amazing unending love and amazing grace. Thank you so much for that message in music, Clyde, that beautiful, beautiful word about the grace of our God, words that we've been singing about all morning, and I'm so grateful to you for singing that for us as well. Unending joy, unending love, amazing grace. A few years back, in the days of the pandemic, many of you were introduced to something for the first time, that had already been tested here and there, but hadn't really become prevalent until it was necessary. And that was the idea, the concept of telehealth, where instead of going to the doctor's office, instead of seeing your physician, looking them in the eye, telling them what it was you were experiencing and then getting a diagnosis. Instead, you did all of that to your computer in your living room, to the camera there on your desktop, and you would have the entire appointment virtually. This is something that, as I said, has become more common as a matter of convenience since those days because we learned pretty quick that there are times where that works just fine, where you say, 
I know what my symptoms are. I know it's cold and flu season. I'm pretty sure I know what's going on here. All I need from you is my Tamiflu prescription. So doctor, how about we do this over the computer? I tell you my symptoms, you tell me this is the problem, and we take care of this without me driving 45 minutes through Dallas traffic to get to you 45 minutes back home. So there are times where this telehealth concept is, is really quite convenient. If you know what the problem is, your doctor knows what the problem is, you just need the prescription, it's really helpful for that. If you're doing just your standard checkup, it's helpful for that. If you're doing a brief little consultation, it's helpful for that. But then there are those times where you've got a problem. You've got an ailment of some sort, and you don't know what the issue is. Maybe you have been brave enough to go to WebMD, but now you're more scared. And now you want to talk to a real-life doctor. You want to speak with a physician, and you want them to look you up and down. You want them to run tests. You want them to do those things that doctors do live and in person that they can't do from miles away to a computer screen. There are those times when you are sick and you want to be made well. And a doctor can't do that from long distance. In our passage this morning, Jesus compares himself to a doctor. Kelly read the passage for us just a moment ago. Let me just remind you of that one verse. It was Matthew 9, verse 12, where Jesus said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. This morning, we're going to talk about what it was exactly that Jesus meant by that and about what kind of doctor, what kind of great physician, what kind of healer Jesus is. Because what I think you're going to see this morning is that Jesus isn't so much into telehealth. Jesus isn't so much into long-distance care. Because what makes Jesus so different attractive to the disreputable is the same thing that makes him so dangerous to the reputable. That Jesus isn't afraid of sinners. In fact, he loves them. So if you've got your Bible this morning or you want to grab one of the ones in front of you, you got so good at that with the hymnal, um, then we're in Matthew chapter 9, Verses 9 through 12 this morning, short little passage. If you weren't here last week, then let me catch you up just briefly on what it is we're doing in this season leading up to Easter. In the season of Lent, our series is called Teaching the Teachers, and it's all about Jesus' various encounters with the folks known then as the teachers of the law. This was the religious establishment of Judea made up of the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the priests. And eventually in this series, we'll differentiate between those various groups, but it's not that important today. Today, just knowing that they're all clumped together as the teachers of the law will suffice. And these teachers of the law, it was their vocation, it was their job to study the Old Testament, to study the law and the prophets, and then apply what they read to the daily life of the general population of God's people. So in other words, what they did was pretty similar to what I do every week. Except that where my authority is merely spiritual, and you can hear what I say and then immediately dismiss it if you want to, not that you would, the teachers of the law, in fact, had social capital, had judicial authority. Their rulings based upon God's law carried some heft to them. Now, when we talk about these teachers of the law, as we will be over the next month, those of you who have been in church for a good long time, those of you who have read the Gospels on more than one occasion, backwards and forwards, y'all probably have a pretty negative opinion of these teachers. And I get it. Because 
after all, every Sunday of this series, you are going to see them disagree with Jesus about something. You're going to see them in conflict with Jesus. He's going to say one thing, they're going to think the exact opposite thing. And around here, we're team Jesus. So I can understand why you would say these teachers of the law, not a fan. I think they're the problem, and I don't want to ally myself with them under any circumstances. Now, in this particular passage, speaking of their conflicts with Jesus, they see him having dinner with some of the most notorious sinners of the day. And their question is a pretty basic one. What's up with that? What's he doing that for? Why is Jesus doing that? And because of our opinion about the teachers of the law, which you may have arrived at after years and years of reading Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, it is really easy in this moment to caricature these people as cold and as heartless and as unloving, to call them hypocrites and worse. But here's the thing. If the teachers of the law were around today, and by the way, they are, you would think they were great people. I promise you, if the teachers of the law were around today, you would be a big fan. These were the folks who never missed a day at temple. They were there every time the doors were open to worship and to sacrifice. These were the folks who gave generously to charity. These were those who served on your various boards and committees. They were pillars of the community. These were respectable folks. Sure, but... But how did they treat people on the margins? You're probably wondering. I mean, this is part of what they got in conflict with Jesus about after all. So, so how did they treat people who weren't like them? Well, honestly, they could quote for you chapter and verse from the Old Testament. They knew what God's word had to say about those on the margins. They could have quoted from memory for you Deuteronomy 15:11 that you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy and to the poor in your land. That's why they gave so generously. They could have quoted Leviticus 23, 22, that when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest, but rather you shall leave them for the poor and for the alien. They knew that this was the law God had given his people to make sure that allowances were made for the poor and the needy, and the stranger. They knew Deuteronomy 27, 19. Cursed is anyone who withholds justice from the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. They knew what God had to say about the people who were not as well off as they were. And they responded to that law. They gave of their money. They gave to the temple, to the charity structure of the day, and sometimes they gave even directly to the poor that were begging there on the streets. Okay, but they probably weren't very merciful, right? They saw God as a God of judgment and justice, that he was a harsh, unyielding father, and they just disregarded all the parts about mercy that we treasure so dearly. But again... They believed in the mercy of God. Psalm 145, 19, the Lord is good to all and he has compassion on all that he has made. They sang this in temple every Sunday. Deuteronomy 4, 31, the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not abandon or destroy or forget the covenant with your ancestors, which he confirmed to them by oath. And they believed God called them to be merciful too. Some of them had probably taught a Sunday school lesson on Proverbs 14, 21, that whoever despises his neighbor is a sinner, but blessed is he who's generous to the poor. And as much as we Christians like to think that we discovered this verse, these folks knew Micah 6, 8. Seek justice, love mercy, 
walk humbly with your God. They knew what the prophet had said. But they believed in something else, too. There was something else they valued as well. Purity. They believed that sin is dangerous and that sin is tempting and so that it's best avoided. They believed that they were children of God, partners in the covenant, and that they needed to act like it. They needed to be different from the sinners of their day. They believed that associating with the wrong kind of people would send the wrong kind of message. And so they owed it to themselves. In fact, they owed it to God himself to stay away from bad influences, from anybody who might endanger their walk with God, from anybody who might threaten the reputation that they had worked so hard to earn. The teacher of the law gave advice that's not that much different from the advice that a parent gives to their 12-year-old when he or she is entering middle school. The teachers of the law had a reasonable, respectable, honorable approach to life. And I'm here to tell you today that if everybody in society lived their way, things would go pretty great. Things would run very smoothly. But here's the thing. Not everybody did. Not everybody would. I'm not sure everybody could. Because in a world of Pharisees and Sadducees, in a world of scribes and priests, there were also liars and cheats and outcasts. And when Jesus came to this world, he had the audacity to say, I'm going to focus on them. Look at verse 9 in the passage. It's a one verse story. Jesus is walking along, and he sees a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, Follow me. And he got up and followed him. Sarah did a great job explaining to the kids and to you as well why tax collectors were even more unpopular in those days than they are in March of 2024. Because they not only collected your hard-earned money for the government, but they collected a little bit more than they were supposed to and kept what was not theirs to take. Not only that, not only were they cheats, they were also considered traitors by the people. Because the government that they were collecting for was not a duly elected government as ours is. It was not a government that had been elected by the people. It was the Roman government, which was actively oppressing the Jewish people. So the tax collectors, who were Jews, were taking from their own people to give it to the Romans, and that went over about as well as you might expect. They were cheats, they were liars, they were traitors. And Matthew is one of them. Now, because his name is attached to the gospel... Because we name our children after him today, because he ends up being a disciple of Jesus, sometimes we make assumptions about him that are not found anywhere in the text. We say, well, if Jesus picked him out, and if he immediately followed, well, then he was probably already reconsidering what he was doing with his life. He was a tax collector for then, but all he needed was that little nudge from Jesus, and he was ready to go on the straight and narrow. Surely this is somebody who was a tax collector only in name, but his heart had already begun to change. Well, maybe. It doesn't say that. What it says is that he was sitting in his tax booth. He was right there at the office like he was any other day of the week. And what happened was that Jesus saw somebody that a respectable person wouldn't be caught dead with and said, him. I want him for my kingdom. 
I'm not going to wait to talk with him once the crowds are gone. I'm not going to put in a call in private. I want him at my side right now. And then verse 10 tells us that after Matthew gets up to follow Jesus, Matthew invites his buddies over for a little get-together to meet this man that Matthew's now going to be following for the next few years. And something I want to make sure that you're mindful of about this little party, this little dinner, this little get-together, these are not church folks. So the music that's playing in this party is not KLTY. The beverages being served are not iced tea and lemonade. That's not the kind of party that we're talking about. That's not the kind of house Jesus is going to here. This is the kind of house that the teachers of the law would not have wanted to park their cars in front of. The kind of house where if you've got to go for some reason, you park one block over and you walk, just in case your friend or your boss sees your car in the neighborhood. And yet, there's Jesus, right there in the thick of it, sharing a meal with these people. Which brings us to the conflict. The question that the teachers of the law ask of Jesus' disciples. What's your master doing? Why is he deigning to eat with these people? Why them? And Jesus' answer is pretty simple. Because they need me and because I love them. Because it's the sick who need a doctor, not the healthy. Because I've come not to call the righteous, but sinners. Because God doesn't wait for you to clean up your mess before he goes chasing after you. There's a really wonderful story that the pastor and preacher Matt Chandler over at the Village Church in Dallas tells. And tells the story of when he was in college and he was a believer and he was going to some sort of special revival event, some big church event and he invited a friend of his to come along with him, a friend who was not a believer, somebody who did not know Christ, and he wanted to get her to come with him. He thought that this would be an environment where she'd feel welcome, she'd have a good time, she'd get to hear the gospel, and he thought this was a great opportunity for her to hear the word. So he brought her along to this event. And he got there, and the pastor gets up in front of this large group of young people and says, today I'm going to talk about sex. And of course, he hung his head the way that anybody does when they invite a friend to church. The friend finally comes, and then they hear what the pastor's going to talk about that day. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. And the pastor holds up a, a rose in front of everybody. He says, look, look at this beautiful rose of mine. Beautiful color, smells amazing, fresh, just this beautiful, beautiful. Take, take a look, everybody. Look at, look at my rose. And then he throws it out into the crowd and says, pass this around. I want, I want all of you to get a look at this beautiful rose of mine. And then he launches into what Chandler says was one of the worst sermons on sex and purity that he'd ever heard in his life. Lots of talk about STDs, lots of talk about all of the things that you were doing, all of the things that you were telling about yourself if you were to be impure. And when he got to the end, to really bring his point home, the preacher looked out in the crowd and said, where's, where's my rose? Where's my rose? Somebody brings it up to the stage, hands it to him. And the rose by now has several of the petals have fallen off. It's bent, sagging. It barely resembles the beautiful rose that he'd begun with. And says, when you are impure, 
this is what you become. Who would want this? And God bless Matt Chandler because he says that in that moment he was so angry sitting there in his seat that it was all he could do not to stand to his feet and shout at that preacher, Jesus wants the rose. Jesus wants the rose. For our sake, God made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus was morally perfect, spiritually flawless, but for the sake of sinners, he paid a penalty that was not his. He bore a burden that was not his. He took on a weight that was not his. And so at Matthew's house, in Matthew chapter 9, he bore the dirty looks and the whispers because on the cross, he would bear the shame and the mockery. Respectable people wouldn't be caught dead with people like Matthew. But Jesus, with an eye on the cross, says that's exactly what I intend to do. Here's what I want you to understand, church family, about the teachers of the law and about Jesus. You will lose no friends living life like the teachers of the law. You will lose no status. You will lose no respect if you live like them. But if you live like the teachers of the law, you will win no one to the kingdom. Because the teachers of the law were unwilling to risk their reputation or their spiritual purity for the sake of sinners. They would pray for them, maybe write a check when it was appropriate, preach at them, all the things we can do from a safe distance. But that's not how healing happens. It's not how love happens. Christian love, Christian love, Christ-like love, is up close and personal. It's Jesus going to a tax collector and saying, you're the one I want. Follow me. The next three years you're spending with me. It's Jesus going to his house and saying, I want to meet every one of your friends. Not because I've got some ulterior motive, but because I love them. And I want them to know me. Christian love doesn't happen from a distance. It happens when you get to know the folks. Come to love the folks that you've been told you have to stay away from. It happens when you are Jesus to those who need him the most. Let's pray together, and then we'll prepare to take the supper. Father God, I thank you for this day that you've given to us. And Lord, I thank you for the amazing grace that you show us. I thank you, Lord, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly, for the unrighteous, for us. That before we cleaned up our mess, you came running after us. That you called, that you took the initiative so that with repentant hearts, we could find you. Father, I thank you for that love which took Jesus all the way to the cross where he gave his body and his blood so that we could know eternal salvation with you, so that we could be saved in you. 
Lord, as we prepare to take this supper together, I pray that we would remember the grace you have shown and what it cost. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. The song which is about to be played is one that you may know the words to, you may not, but that's okay. We're just going to play it instrumentally as it is. The title of it is, O Come to the Altar. And so this morning, the way that I'm going to ask you to take the supper is as the music plays. I want you to take a moment there in your seat to reflect and to pray. Thanking God for the grace which you have been shown and asking the Spirit for guidance, for direction on how you can show that grace to others. Take just a moment there in your seat. Take a beat. Pray to God. And as the music plays when you're ready, I invite you to come forward. Take a piece of the bread, take a cup, and return to your seat. And then, after a few minutes, together, we'll take the supper together. If there's anybody here who it's difficult for you to get up, I'm going to ask a few of our deacons to, be, keep, to keep your eyes out. Slip a hand in the air, and they'll bring you what you need. But for those who are able, I invite you, after that moment of prayer, to come forward and to receive the supper. We'll hear the music. O come to the altar. And I hope that you will.
we take the supper together at the end of every month here at South Garland Baptist Church, and we do it a little differently each time. I know that the coming forward is not the favorite of all of you. It's not as tidy as when it's passed out, but I, I have to say on a morning where we're talking about Matthew the tax collector and Jesus calling him to follow, I'm not sure tidy is what we need today. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that can pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. We sang those words together earlier in the service, reflecting and praising God for the grace that he showed us by sending Jesus. Born as a baby in Bethlehem to be laid in a humble manger, a Jesus who in his ministry proclaimed the coming of the kingdom of God, showed what that looked like through miracles, signs, and wonders by healing the sick and driving out the demons. But ultimately, the grace of our God in Jesus Christ was most fully displayed in the most unlikely of places, on a cross, the execution device of the Romans. Jesus, before the whole Roman and Judean public, was mocked, was humiliated, was stripped and beaten, and ultimately was crucified. It's hard to imagine the Son of God enduring that kind of mortification. But he did it for us. He did it for sinners like Matthew and his friends, for lost sheep in need of a good shepherd. Jesus went to the cross where he gave his body and his blood so that we could be saved, so that we could know eternal life with God. Bread and a cup are how we remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. These elements that we don't just look at from a distance, but we take in, that we consume, that become a part of us to remind us of that grace. And so, as a reminder, as an act of remembrance, I take you back to the last supper that Jesus would share with his disciples with Peter and with John, with Judas, and yes, with Matthew, where Jesus said to them that this, this bread, this is my body that is given for you. So do this now in remembrance of me. In our series this month, this season, we're talking about these teachers of the law who serve for us as representatives of the old covenant, the first covenant God made with his people, a covenant grounded in law. Jesus on the cross instituted a new covenant, made not in laws on paper, but given rather by his blood. He said to his disciples, as he says to us today, that this, this cup, representative of the blood of Jesus, this is the new covenant in my blood. So do this in remembrance of me.
Would you pray with me? God and Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for this morning of worship that we have experienced and participated in together. We thank you for this hour where we could sing about your infinite, matchless, amazing grace. We thank you for your word given by faithful apostles and passed down through the years. This word which is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. This word which ministers to us day by day. But God, most of all, we thank you for the love that you show us. The love which you showed when Jesus went to that cross to fulfill our debt, to pay our penalty. We thank you, Lord, that after that cross, there came an empty tomb that the cross is no mere act of martyrdom, but simply the prelude to victory in Jesus. And so, Lord, with the cross at the front of mind, we look forward to the glorious return of our Savior, to the resurrection to come for all who place their faith in him. And as we go through our daily lives, may we show a fraction of the grace that we have been shown. It's in Jesus' name that I pray all these things. Amen. You probably think I'm done, and I'm very close. But I get to do something exciting now. I don't know where he is. Paul, would you mind joining me up front? This is Paul Campion. Um, some of y'all have gotten to know Paul over the last, last few months. He has been visiting. He's become a part of the Cornerstone Sunday School class, um, and he has even served upstairs in the audiovisual booth. God bless you. Um, and Paul comes this morning because he and I have had opportunity to have some really good conversations, and he comes forward because on March the 10th, Paul would like to be baptized into the kingdom of God, and into the fellowship of this church body. I am very excited to see the water filled up in that baptistry. And if you are as well, if you would affirm Paul in his decision, if you would affirm him in joining our church by baptism, then give me an upraised hand. Amen, amen. Well, then on March the 10th, Paul, is when you will be baptized. It's a special date for Paul. I'll tell you more about that on the day. Um, but make sure before you leave today that you give him a big hug and welcome him to the family. This morning, we've done quite a bit of good spiritual business. There's a little bit of administrative business we have to do as well. We'll enter into church conference here in just a moment, and before we do that, I'll just leave you with this word of benediction, that God has shown us matchless, marvelous grace in Christ. May we show grace by the way that we live. We'll begin church conference in just a moment.